it was interesting to be thinking uh, in the kids' talk about uh, what freedom looks like and the fact that, yeah, there is a sense in which being a Christian, being part of a church, is nothing to do with rules and following rules and doing things uh, to please God or be right with God or in favour with God or anything like that. Uh, I had a teacher at Bible College who I remember saying uh, he was an Old Testament lecturer and the lecture I think must have been around the Ten Commandments and he said uh, when a Christian keeps the Ten Commandments, keeps any of the Ten Commandments, there's a sense in which they do it by accident. By which he meant we don't keep the rules, the Ten Commandments or anything else in the Bible that comes as an instruction or a command, because it's a command, but rather because we know the Lord Jesus Christ, rather because we've declared him to be Lord in our lives. And he's the boss, he rules, he's rescued us from slavery to sin, which was doing things our way. And he set us free to live under a different Lord, him, himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the rule is not what's fundamental, do the right thing. The relationship is what's fundamental. Know the right Lord and live for him. And when we do that, when we know him well, when we know him through his word, we know his heart and his desire then what happens is that our hearts get transformed. By his Holy Spirit who lives in us, our hearts get transformed so that we're not doing something because we're told from the outside to do it, but rather we're doing something because we want to do it, because we know that it's what the Lord desires for us, what is best for us. And that's a radically different way to live, isn't it? Rather than having laws and rules imposed on us that we have to keep and that we have to make sure we're not transgressing or whatever, rather knowing the Lord and wanting him to be Lord in our lives and, uh, and living for him. So that's the idea of Christian freedom. It's a, quite a peculiar idea, really, uh, when compared with some other ideas of freedom, uh, ideas that that actually um, accentuate or emphasise doing what you want to do. Uh, Christian freedom is doing or having a heart that desires what God wants, a heart that is aligned uh, with what God wants. Uh, Paul is addressing a very particular uh, example in this passage. Uh, It's this issue of whether to eat or not to eat food sacrificed to idols. And you might hear that and go, not really an issue uh, for me. Although, maybe, maybe that is something you've experienced. Uh, But what we're going to see is that in answering the question, Paul uh, applies some really basic, fundamental, helpful gospel principles that are transferable to all sorts of other situations. Uh, And so our task will be to hear the principles, to understand them, so that we can then grab hold of them and take them Uh, into our everyday lives. So let's pray that the Spirit would uh, enable that. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would uh, teach us by your Spirit now that as we hear the words that Paul spoke, we wouldn't be hearing them as as some guy uh, with only his authority, but rather as uh, your word written for them and for us. Uh, Help us to translate uh, things from that time and culture to our circumstances so that, uh, yeah, so that we might have hearts full of a desire to live for Jesus and also minds full of how uh, to do that well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, quite close to the start, in chapter 1, uh, after the intro, the next verse, uh, verse 10, 
This is Paul's initial appeal. Right? So remember, this is the context and all the issues that he addresses uh, in this context. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's what Paul wants for them. That is what is best for them, uh, that they agree with one another, that there be no divisions, that they be perfectly united. But there are divisions. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that are causing friction and breakdown of relationship uh, among them. And one of those is this issue of whether or not to eat food sacrificed to idols. And they, they've written to him and they said, look, we can't sort this one out. Help us, please. What's the answer? Is it yes or is it no? Of course, the yes camp, they want him to say, yeah, go for it, no problem, eat whatever you want. And the no camp, they want him to say, uh, no, of course not, don't be fools, steer clear. And Paul says, well, it depends. <laughs> so he doesn't please either party, which is probably a good thing. He doesn't kind of come down uh, on one side or the other and then put them in a situation where one sort of has to begrudgingly come towards the other. Rather, he, not just to compromise, but to put forth the gospel way, he says, it depends. There's other things you need to consider. Now, I reckon these chapters are a bit like uh, one of those maths questions where you have to show you're working. Remember that at school or maybe, you know, where you can't just there's the answer and get, get all the marks. You have to show how you got the answer. It's not multiple choice, uh, A or B, yes or no. Uh, it's you've got to show you're working. Uh, and that's what Paul does. He helps the Corinthians, not just, he doesn't just give them an answer, he, he shows them how he got there. Um, he wants them to get full marks, you see. That is, he wants them to be able to truly live in this united fashion that Christ has called them to and that the Spirit uh, is, uh, can enable them to. He wants them to really understand what the question is that's being asked and all the variables involved. And hearing Paul's working is going to help us uh, to apply the principles to all sorts of other issues and situations. So uh, the first thing that Paul does is he makes a distinction between what you can do and what you should do. I reckon that's a really important distinction, one that perhaps we're not all that good at making. Sometimes we just go, well, if you can, you do. If you can and you want to, you do. But there's a very important step, a very important question to ask, and that is, okay, just because you can do something, you still need to ask, should you? As in, is it best for you to do that? Uh, Paul does this uh, in two, two places. He sets things up in two places, actually at the beginning and the end of the passage, and he talks about what's permissible, right? That is what they can do, at least in theory, what they can do. And that is, he says, you know, in a certain sense, it's okay. It's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols. He does it uh, in chapter 8, uh, at the beginning, verses 4 to 6, about, food eating, uh, sorry, about eating food sacrificed to idols... Uh, he quotes them. He says, We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. And he, he agrees with them. He says it's true. An idol, and the Bible says this very clearly, an idol was something made by human hands. It's, it's a nothing. Right? It's, it's just a puppet, a, a little doll. That's all an idol really is. Um, and the, the whole Bible sort of agrees with that. Picture. You know, the Old Testament's full of stories of these idols that are mocked by God. So, for example, you might, you might know the story of Dagon. So, uh, when the Ark, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, was uh, captured by the Philistines at one point, it wasn't in Israel's possession anymore. It was taken by their enemies, the Philistines, and the Philistines thought this was a great coup because they'd captured the God of Israel because they thought that the God, you know, was the thing pretty much. And so they, they took it to their capital city, they took it to Ashdod, and they put it in the temple of their god Dagon, because right? uh, now, look, now we've got more gods, you know, we're more powerful, we've got their god, we've got our god, sit it next to Dagon there, excellent. They went to sleep, they woke up in the morning, the priests went into the temple, and they found Dagon 
the, well, that is the statue thing of Dagon, face down in front of the Ark of the Covenant. No one had been in there. Uh, God was playing games, basically. And he said, you think you got me? <laughs> you think your God is anything beside me, compared to me? No, nah, not really. And they were a bit embarrassed about this, of course. The priests, oh, don't let anyone see. Pick him up, put him back in his place. No one will know. Uh, the next morning, they went back to the temple and things were worse. Dagon had not only fallen over again in front of the ark, but his head had fallen off and his hands had gone flying. And, you know, and God is showing, he's just showing them that, yeah, it's, it's a nothing. It's, it's just a thing. It has no power, not compared to the living God of not just Israel, but all the world. Uh, there are plenty of other stories, I won't take the time to tell them, plenty of other stories in the Old Testament where God reveals that, yes, an idol is nothing. And so Paul can happily agree with this statement. Even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many, in inverted commas, gods and many lords, yet we know, we know the truth. For us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. And besides him, there is no other. And then in chapter 10, uh, so he's saying, and because of that, fine, food sacrificed to idols, an idol's nothing, so it's no big deal if you eat something that's been sacrificed to one of these idols. At the end, in chapter 10, uh, verse 25, he says, kind of breaks it down to some practical implications about when they go shopping and when they go to a friend's house for a meal. He says, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. Don't worry. Don't worry, but don't let it trouble you, okay? Um, food sacrificed to idols, it was, it was a very common practice in, in almost any sort of religion. And Corinth was, every sort of religion was represented. So it was likely, but he says, don't worry, just go to the market, buy the, buy the meat, eat it. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And if an unbeliever, if a friend invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. You don't need to be burdened by worry, he says. Go about your everyday life. There's nothing scary. You don't need to be afraid. Just get on with it. Enjoy, buy that food. Enjoy that meal with friends. So that's, you're allowed. It's free. You have freedom. You can eat food sacrificed to idols. You have the right to do so. And yet, in between those two uh, those two short passages, Paul gives them two really good reasons to think twice before tucking in, before picking up the knife and the fork and hoeing into their meal. Just because they can doesn't decide whether or not they should. Uh, the two reasons that Paul gives are that, first of all, we should use our freedom for the sake of others, rather than just for our own sake. But secondly, we should also use our freedom for our own sake. So we'll do what, how we should do it for the sake of others first, and then we'll think about uh, using our freedom for our own sake. Uh, firstly, the social context, right? We like to think uh, that the way that we act doesn't really matter to anybody else. It would be kind of convenient if that were true, but it's not true. Most things that we do in life have an impact on others, especially when we do it in the presence of other people, when they see or perhaps when they hear about the choices we make and the things we do. Uh, you may not have two million Instagram followers or Snapchat whatever's. Uh, you may not even have Instagram or Snapchat. Um, I don't. Um, but we're all influencers. You know, you know that... that terminology, influencer. The reality is, uh, at least in some small way, we all have an influence on others. Our actions reflect and communicate our attitudes, beliefs, and values. Right? What we do on the outside comes from somewhere. It comes from inside. It reflects what matters to us. And when people see that, either consciously or subconsciously, they take note of what matters to us. And 
depending, particularly depending on the relationship, that can have a strong influence over what they then do, their own behaviour and uh, what they value and what's important to them. Uh, especially when the relationship is close, uh, there's a strong influence. So we know that parents have really strong influences over their children. Parents have to be very thoughtful and careful about the way that they live, not just towards their children, but in front of their children because of the influence that gets passed on. Of course, that's true for grandparents as well and f close friends, other important people in our lives. But did you know that even strangers have an influence uh, over us, especially if it's lots of strangers doing the same kinds of things? We call that culture, right? The, what, what we live in and among. Uh, so, for example, uh, I don't know if this happens to you, or I'm just confessing my own sin, but, uh, you know, I, if I'm uh, running late somewhere and, uh, and it's busy and I can't find a car park uh, and I notice that there's a spot on the side of the road where there's that yellow line, you know, on the side of the road, which usually means you're not allowed to park there. Uh, maybe always, but anyway. Uh, but what happens when you see that other people have parked there? Well, you know what I do, or at least I've done. I go, oh, they must know something I don't know. It must be okay to park there, because look, they all have, and it's not like you know they're going to book ten people all at once and mm, park. Uh, because other people have done it, I'm influenced to do what they've done, even though not too far back in my head, I know I shouldn't. Just one little example. But uh, others influence us. Even strangers uh, can influence us. Um, we, we don't like to admit it. We prefer the myth of independence, right? That firstly, I'm fully in control of my own actions. No one's influencing me. Rubbish. You are influenced by others. And secondly, we love to think that uh, we are fully exempt from responsibility for the actions of others. But that's not true either, because what we do has influence. Uh, it's not true in society in general, and it's certainly not true in God's family, in Christ's body. And we've got to think about that in the choices that we make. We're social creatures. We live in a social context. Our choices matter not just for us, but for others as well. So Paul explains a scenario in which theological knowledge, that is knowing what is true, is not enough. That is, our choices have to be guided by more than just what is true, what is a fact. Uh, a situation where the objective reality has to be considered in light of and even shaped by the subjective perception that what others perceive, uh, where the needs, in fact, of the weak person, the person who may even be wrong, have to be given priority over the desires of the strong person who is sure that they're right. Uh, and that situation is this one about eating food sacrificed to idols. Have a look at chapter 8, verse 7, where Paul describes what can happen if we exercise our freedom without due consideration of how it affects other people. So it's just spoken about what everybody knows, or at least what they know, those who possess knowledge. And then he says, but not everyone possesses this knowledge. Not everyone understands this basic reality that an idol is nothing and therefore it's okay to eat the food. Uh, some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. So it's, you don't have to think too hard to understand the scenario. Maybe you've been in this scenario yourself. That is where you've been part of a culture that engages in some sort of practice like this. You've grown up in that culture. All your life you've thought that this was the way. And even when you've heard that no, Jesus is Lord, and all of that's just a, a load of rubbish. Still, you're so, you're so attached to that culture that you can't shake the feeling that there's still something in it. It's not hard to understand, is it? 
And Paul is saying we need to be mindful of anybody who finds themselves in that situation, not just so that we don't offend them, but actually because even though the objective reality may be that it is not sin to eat the food that's been sacrificed to idols, it is sin to go against your conscience, by which I mean, if you believe that something is wrong before God and yet you do it anyway, you're sinning against God. You're, you're choosing to go against God. You're making a choice against your conscience. And Paul says we need to actually take that into account in the choices that we make, that others may uh, be in that situation. And he makes it very clear that how involved we are in their sin. In verse 9 he says, Be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak, for if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge and all your freedom, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? And so, this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed brought down by your knowledge. When you sin against them, you see, he's, he doesn't beat around. When you fail to consider them, when you instead hold to your rights, you sin against them and in this way wound their conscience and sin against Christ himself. See, this is part of what it means to be a united body, all the parts attached to each other. We no longer act independently or without consideration of how our actions affect other people. We no longer hold to our rights because we have others, brother and brothers and sisters, to consider. You know, I admit that, uh, you know that expression, uh, he doesn't suffer fools lightly. Sometimes that can describe me. I can be on my high horse. I know what's right, what's wrong, what I can and can't do. And it's really, really easy to look down on other people. But Paul says, never do that. Get down off your high horse. Don't look on others in, uh, who don't possess the same knowledge of you in that way. Yes, they may be weak, they may be ignorant, but that's not a cause to look down on them. That is a cause, that is a reason to care for them, to be considerate of them, to be gentle with them. So easy to justify our behaviour simply on the grounds that we're right or that we have the right. But Paul says knowledge puffs up, love builds up. That is, knowledge not shaped by love, just makes us proud and arrogant and causes us to sin against others. So easy to get puffed up with our own rightness and our rights and lose sight of something far more important, which is the conscience, the life, the soul of a weak brother or sister for whom Christ died. Christ laid down his rights for them. He laid down his life for them. And all he's really asking is that we lay down our knife and fork for them. <laughs> it's a bit absurd, isn't it, when you would think of not giving up that tiny little right in light of what Christ has given up that they might be rescued and saved and brought into his family. Christ's family is so precious to him, surely it should be precious to us as well. Uh, when we choose not to do that, Paul is very clear, our rights have become very, very wrong. It's all too easy to be right in our head and wrong in our heart. In chapter 9, Paul goes on to apply this gospel logic to how he approaches his ministry to unbelievers. So he's talked about how it should be in the family of God, and now he's talking about uh, in ministry towards those who don't know Jesus yet. He talks uh, in that chapter, in chapter 9, all about his freedom and his rights as an apostle. 
Uh, he particularly speaks about his right to be paid for his work. But in verse 12, he states uh, what he's done with that right. We did not use this right, he says. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Although he doesn't say it explicitly, it seems that Paul's decision not to receive payment from those he ministered to was driven by a concern that if he was paid, it might undermine the message and his ministry by bringing his motives into question. Are you just doing it for the money, Paul? Uh, Remember Acts 18, that's where the gospel came to Corinth, where uh, Paul arrived and he met up with Priscilla and Aquila, the tent makers, remember this from last year, and he worked hard. He joined with them, they gave him a job and he worked hard in the business, making the tents during the day, and his gospel witnessing happened at night. Even when he was freed up from that, it wasn't because people started paying him for his ministry, it was because uh, others came along to help him in the work and he had more time to get on with his gospel ministry. That's how he approached his ministry in Corinth, this, the same people who he's writing this letter to now. But it seems ironically that some of them got the wrong idea about Paul. <laughs> they thought, oh, maybe he's not worth it. <laughs> so he's trying to lay down his rights so that the gospel message won't be undermined, but they're judging with human eyes, right, where your value is measured in dollars or whatever the currency was. Uh, and so he has to explain to them uh, that that's not the case at all because it seems that they were questioning his ministry, questioning his apostleship, questioning perhaps even his gospel. At the start of verse 9, uh, it says, uh, this is my defence, verse 3, this is my defence to those who sit in judgment on me. That's what chapter 9 is all about. Yet again, the Corinthians have failed to see the gentle power and the deep wisdom of the gospel in action. They've just totally misunderstood what Paul is doing. And so Paul lays it out for them. Uh, in verse 19, he says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. What's a slave? It's somebody who works for no pay. And Paul says, that's what I've chosen. I'm free, I belong to no one, but I've made myself a slave to everyone, to you, to win as many as possible. That's my motive. And again, uh, in verse 22, the second half of the verse, uh, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul does not stand on his rights. He throws them out the window and he says, whatever is needed I will do that those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that those who are destined for an eternity separated from him in hell, under his judgment, will be set free themselves, will be brought into the kingdom of Jesus Christ and into forgiveness of sin and eternal life. That's how Paul makes his choices. So whether it's for the sake of believers or for the sake of unbelievers, the principle's the same. The gospel sets us free from serving ourselves. doesn't set us free to serve ourselves. That's sin. <laughs> sets us free from serving ourselves and demanding our rights so that we can serve others and build up the body of Christ. The gospel teaches us a new question to ask in order to make our choices. Not can I, but should I? Not will it serve me, but will it serve the body of Christ? How do we apply those? As I said, uh, you may not be faced with the situation at all of uh, having to work out should you eat food sacrificed to idols. Although, perhaps because of your background, that is something that you encounter. You might have grown up in a culture where that is common practice. And the reality is that Australia itself is becoming a more multicultural place and we're more likely to have friends and know people who may still engage or be affected by uh, those practices from their own past. So it's, it's definitely not uh, something that's irrelevant, I reckon. Um, but even apart from that, even apart from uh, our own background or a multicultural perspective, the reality is that even, even our 
enlightened Western secularist materialistic there is no spiritual world culture actually has its forms of worship, doesn't it? It has its values, it has its temples, it has its priorities. There's a massive temple just down the road. I'm not talking about the one next door. About a kilometre that way, Harbour Town, it's called. Worshippers, there's so many worshippers down there right now as we speak, aren't there? Right? And we need to be careful even about how our own just attitudes towards standard of living and the stuff of the world and all that. What does it communicate about our values and our priorities? What, how do we engage and yet in a way that doesn't cause a stumbling block to anybody else or miscommunicate uh, what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ? How do, we, how do we live in this world, this materialistic world that doesn't hold Jesus up or esteem him or see him as anything but rather just values stuff and experiences and the 80-year lifespan that we get here? We need to engage in that culture, but we need to do it in a way that isn't syncretistic, that isn't putting our Christian faith and trying to meld it together with this. Rather, we live in this world, but we don't live of this world. It's a challenge. Uh, and so we need to know our culture. We need to understand it. We need to be critiquing our culture and, and asking those big questions at the cultural level, but also... If we want to apply uh, Paul's principles here, I think another good question to uh, ask is, or, or another good practice to engage in is simply to know our friends. If we want to live in a way that serves our friends, whether they be believers or unbelievers, the best way to do that is to know what does affect them and how. What are the potential stumbling blocks that might be there for them? Don't be embarrassed to ask the questions, just get to know each other well and then we'll be much better placed to serve other people if we're simply uh, building relationships with one another. So that's the first context, the social context. The second is the spiritual context. Paul uh, has this second reason for limiting his freedoms and he wants his hearers to learn from his example in this too. You see, just as you can be right in your head and wrong in your heart, you can also be right on the surface of things, but wrong deeper down. In chapter Paul again, uh, sorry, in chapter ten again, Paul shows his working uh, that just as there's a social context in which we make our choices about how we use our freedom, there's also a spiritual context. See, we might read that stuff about an idol is nothing and go, <laughs> I mean, who believes that stuff anyway, right? It's just a bit of wood. And so, you know, do whatever you want with it. It doesn't matter. But Paul says, well, actually, no, there, there is a spiritual reality. See, we like to box things up. Right? We go, spiritual world, spiritual practices, we put them in this box, they happen at this time of the week, or we, they look like this, and we identify them, we go, that's a spiritual thing. And then there's everything else and we go, well, that's not a spiritual thing, that's just a temporal thing or that's just a physical thing and that fits, you know. When I go to work, it's not a spiritual thing. It's just a physical, temporal, this life thing. But that's not true at all. The reality is that there's a physical realm, a physical world, a temporal world, and there's a spiritual world. And they're always there, both of them. We can't see one, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It's always there and it's always operative. And that's what Paul is actually trying to help the Corinthians understand when it comes to this spiritual context of the choices that they're making uh, about whether or not to eat the food sacrificed to idols. Uh, he introduces this uh, spiritual context, like all good preachers do, with a sporting analogy. Uh, <laughs> uh, chapter 9, verse 24... He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. Don't do anything that might disqualify you from finishing the race and receiving the prize at the end, he says. In other words, he says that life is a journey and we haven't reached the finish line. It's a race and we haven't reached the finish line yet. When we do reach the finish line... Uh, the prize will be ours to enjoy, and what a prize it will be, verse 25. 
Uh, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, a crown of leaves. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And I think verse 23 is actually the crown. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Right? Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul sets aside his rights and his freedoms so that many might be saved, so that at the end of the race, he will be able to share in the blessings of the gospel, in experiencing eternity with all those that he has been blessed to serve and to see saved. That's his finish line. That's how he makes his choices. His eye on the finish line, that determines how he lives and the choices that he makes here and now. And he says to the Corinthians, I don't want you to fall short either. I don't want to fall short and I want you to fall short. And so he warns them of the danger of complacency and compromise. Uh, first, he gives them the example of uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament. They were rescued out of slavery in Egypt. And he says, hey, that's just like us, right? We've been rescued out of slavery to sin. Uh, and uh, then he says, and they were heading for the promised land. And that's just like us. We're heading for our promised land, our finish line, our eternity, our heaven. But then he says, but remember, they didn't make it. <laughs> they fell short. They all died in the wilderness. And why did they die in the wilderness? Because they set their hearts on things other than the Lord, on evil things. And you might know the story of what happened. You know, they were rescued, they were taken to Mount Sinai. Moses is up the mountain, he's given uh, the Ten Commandments, but he's up there a long time, and while he's up there, the people decide uh, that they better have a backup plan, and they take a leaf out of the page of the nations around them, and they go, an idol, that would, could be helpful. Uh, so if we could just get everybody's jewellery, and we'll chuck it all together into the fire, and we'll make an idol a golden calf, and then they made this golden calf and they presented it to the people and they said, here you are, here's your God. And because of that, that generation, that whole generation, failed to reach their promised land. And we might hear that story of what they did and think, that is absurd, that is ridiculous, what fools, what idiots, to make a golden calf and think that that was somehow God. But twice, Paul says that those things that happened then are an example for us. In chapter 10, verse 6, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things, just as they did. In verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. He returns to the issue of food sacrifice to idols and he says it's the same thing because even though an idol is nothing, there's a very real spiritual reality behind it. Uh, in verse 20, he says what that spiritual reality is. Uh, verse 19, do I mean that food sacrifice to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, he's just repeating his point from earlier. The idol itself is nothing, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. Paul is bringing that spiritual, that hidden reality to the fore, and he's saying you need to understand that this is what's going on and that we have no, no place, uh, no part in that. And for uh, people like us and, and the Corinthians, he uses the illustration of the Lord's Supper as to show us that we do understand this. So when we share the Lord's Supper, as, we, as you will next week, there's bread and there's drink. And we don't believe that they are anything other than bread and drink. But we do believe that they point us to and help us to know and experience the spiritual reality of Christ and his body and his blood given for us. There is a spiritual reality that is connected to those physical elements. We believe that. And he says it's exactly the same 
in the pagan rituals. There is a spiritual reality connected to the physical part of the meal. And so don't have anything to do with it for your own sake. Don't have anything to do with it. Steer clear. Have nothing to do with it. It dishonours God and it jeopardises you because it risks you kind of compromising uh, your faith in Jesus, diluting, watering it down, saying that nothing really matters, you know, God won't really care. No, he says God is a jealous God, by which he means that God is the only one who deserves our love and our praise and our worship. And so it's wrong to engage in any other kind of spiritual practice. Uh, now, again, you might think idolatry, not so much of an issue for me, uh, but this is where we've got to remember that there's a spiritual reality behind everything. Uh, there's a great book that really helps me, as well as the Bible, uh, keep this in mind. It's called The Screw Tape Letters. If you've never read that book, pick it up. It just brings it all to life, the, that spiritual reality. Um, the seen and the unseen. And what happens uh, in one realm is connected to what happens in the other. So be careful, says Paul. Not everything is beneficial. Not everything is constructive. Not everything builds up the body of Christ. In fact, many things that in one sense we are free to do can actually be done to the detriment of the body and therefore in service, unwitting though it may be, of Satan. But that doesn't mean that we should be ruled by fear. Because that's one possible response to this, isn't it? To sort of go, oh my goodness, the world's a scary place now. It's like a spiritual minefield. How am I going to not get blown up? Don't be ruled by fear. The way to make sure that we reach the finish line and receive the eternal crown and share in the blessings of God is not to live a life ruled by fear, but ruled by love. That is, ruled by by love for God and love for Christ and ruled by love for one another and for those who don't know Jesus so that many will be saved. If that is the path we plot, there is no danger whatsoever to us. A life ruled by love for God and for others. So remember the gospel. It's that simple. It really is. The gospel sets us free from serving ourselves, sets us free from demanding our rights, so that we can serve others and build up the body of Christ. The gospel teaches us to ask those better questions. Not can I, but should I? Not is it going to serve me, but who else can I serve? Will it serve the body of Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we think we know so much, but sometimes can actually be quite blind. We think we're strong, but we make choices that reveal we are weak. Father, we ask that you would help us to see things more clearly, to see things in light of the gospel, to see that you have laid down your rights and your life for us, uh, to be grateful and to be transformed by that amazing expression of your love to know that we have become united to you and united to one another and therefore uh, what belongs to you and what matters to you uh, is now what belongs and matters to us. That we would cherish our freedom in a way that doesn't express itself in sin and, and uh, self-service but rather uh, in love. In love for you and in love for what you love. In love for Christ and in love for his body with a desire to see uh, that many people come join us and be saved and experience the freedom and the crown uh, that is kept in heaven for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.